Hi everyone. Welcome to session two of Regenerating the Spirit of Democracy. I'm Gary paluso Verdend, and uh, happy to be with you again. Um, in case I forget, towards the end, uh, this uh, videos this week, there are two. One is this presentation, and the other is um, uh, an interview with the author of this book, uh, Jack Jenkins, who writes for Religion News Service. And for anybody who follows uh, Religion News Service, you'll see Jack's uh, byline in there quite often. It's a great interview. He talks about uh, progressive Christian involvement in politics over the last decade or so, and uh, how, in fact, significant that involvement has been. So quite different from the stories of the Christian right and some of what I'm going to be saying this week towards the end of this lecture. So uh, do remember to try to watch uh, both videos if, if you can. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and take a moment here and start the um, Panopto recording. All right, first thought, if you want to poison the soil of democracy uh, and kill trust and tolerance, which will lead to the inability to grow, neighbor regard, competent government, compromising coalitions, quality, justice, forbearance, hope, forgiveness, a good life for future generations and freedom for all. Um, drawing on the uh, image I used last week about soil. So um, that is the negative thought to start with. Now here's something quite positive. Listen with me, if you would, to the words of the Gettysburg Address. Uh, read them along if you want. Um, these, are, of course, are some words from a time when the nation was broken. Um, but catch the theme that Lincoln so incredibly artfully wove into what he wrote here. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth, he birthed to, on this new continent, a new nation conceived, another birth phrase, in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all men were created equal, all persons created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place to those who gave their lives here that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. Conception, battle, death. See the... But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world can little note nor long remember what we say here, I was wrong on that one, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, oh, okay, now we went from death to the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us here to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave their last, the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. There are numerous scholars who have talked about the baptismal imagery uh, that uh, seems embedded in this, the, the um, life before the the baptism, the under the waters, the, the descent into the dead, um, and then reemerging, not as you were before, but in fact, as something better, as, as the, that new birth of freedom, uh, that to which uh, uh, all of us uh, in the nation are to be dedicated. 
Um, but remember what he uh, conceived, conceived with equality, um, a phrase that, as uh, I may say again later, um, uh, equality uh, is in the Declaration. It is in the Gettysburg Address. Equality per se is not in the Constitution. All right, big idea. Uh, and for those of you who have kids or grandkids and you know who Pinky Dinky Doo is, um, you'll know about big ideas. Um, what's the optimal relationship between democracy, liberty, and equality in the U.S.? That's the big idea we're trying to get at today. First, though, I want to talk about this uh, false dichotomy that I sometimes hear um, uh, and I'm sometimes challenged with between republic and democracy. That's a false versus. For in both, people rule either directly or by a subset uh, via their representatives. In both, a republic and a democracy. Uh, and basically, it's not a monarchy. It's not a monarchy. It's somehow that the people are, are at the top of the hierarchy. Republic includes democratic practices and spirit, often in representative rather than pure forms true. I and mean, you could think about democracy as between a republic with representatives uh, or onto pure democracy being everybody votes on everything and nobody can vote for anybody else, right? And so no representatives necessarily. That's the kind of spectrum uh, on which uh, a democracy exists. <clears throat> Both often include a constitution, and that constitution can function either as an exoskeleton or an endoskeleton. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is, you know, an exoskeleton is on the outside. Um, and while it provides some protection, it also kind of is, is the, structure, the structure that holds everybody in and together. When I think about the endoskeleton, it's more organic feeling. And even though I know that's the mixing phrases here, it's more organic feeling to me the, that it's an internal thing that... Uh, that keeps us all together. There's a spirit again to it, not str not simply that. Well, we're we're we have this constitution. This constitution is the only reason that we're together. <clears throat> um, James Madison talked about the difference between um, a, a republic and democracy this way in Federalist Ten. The two great points of difference between a democracy and a republic are first the delegation of the government that is in, in, in the latter to a small number of citizens elected by the rest. Secondly, the greater number of citizens and greater sphere of country over which the latter may be extended. Um, the underlying perception he had here is that pure democracy really belongs in small groups and small geographical areas, think town hall meeting, um, and that democracy on a very large scale would be very liable to factions and that uh, to the majority suppressing the rights of minorities and therefore to some kind of mob rule. Um, the remedy, he thought, by the way, uh, was a representative democracy with a constitution that guarantees and protects minority rights, um, especially, and this is always interesting to think of today, especially uh, the, the minority rights being protected in the Senate, uh, full of the wisest men in the land. All right, so when we talk about democracy, what's the absolute bare minimum for what we're talking about? Since democracy is not one thing, I guess that's the other thing I want to say here. Democracy is not one thing. When we say, I love democracy or I don't want democracy, um, it's always important to ask now, which democracy are you talking about? All right, the bare minimum for having a democracy at all might include, a number of authors talk about this, um, uh, self-governance, voting, translating popular will into some form of legislation or policy, um, a, um, and some minimal claim about what is the spirituality, culture, nature of the people uh, who are uh, uh, together in a democracy. Um, that th This sounds like a, a, an obvious assumption, but let's not make it obvious. Um, the people directly or the people through their elected representatives are able to govern themselves. That's the assumption 
built in to an understanding of democracy. All right, very importantly, democracies can be thought of as either liberal or illiberal. And don't think liberal in terms of liberal conservative. Uh, in classical usage, the, the liberal is going to mean this. Liberal means a highest regard for individual liberties, um, protected from as many government intrusions as possible. In other words, maximal, maximal freedom for the individual and toleration of differences. An illiberal democracy is a democracy in which majority rule um, or uh, minority rules by rigging the system to benefit themselves and keep others in a permanent power minority status. So that would beg a question, for instance, well, what then what's the difference between democracy and a mob? Which was the question that was asked by some of the conservatives in England at the time of our revolution? This is, you know, in fact, as it wasn't, a, it wasn't a question, it was a judgment uh, that what they saw in front of them was a mob. What is it that, uh, that keeps um, a democracy from being a mob? the protection of rights of political minorities, and education in public virtues, such as tolerance, forbearance, not using all the power you have all the time, um, and being honest in your conversation and argument would be just some public virtues. Um, education in public virtues and protection of minority rights are two hallmarks of liberal democracy, and the absence of those are two hallmarks of illiberal democracy. Um, to be fair, it also has to be said that in the US history, um, we started with, in the founding of this nation, a suspicion of too much democracy. And those suspicions are in fact built into the constitution, such as the electoral college. Uh, originally, you may recall that senators were elected in, 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 uh, by state representatives and not by the people directly in those states. Uh, that, uh, well, of course, the Constitution embedded slavery uh, and treated black persons as three-fifths of a person, which, by the way, benefited uh, the slaveholding states and gave them a, a, a higher uh, status in terms of numbers to be able to make sure that they couldn't be outvoted uh, for, uh, for instance, for the elimination of the slave trade or slavery, I should say slavery uh, per se. Um, women, of course, were not included. Um, unproperty white men were not originally included. And indigenous nations were uh, originally not included. Um, not until, in fact, uh, um, uh, I think the early part of the 20th century. Suspicions of too much democracy we're at the start. Um, we've since have broadened that, right? We've broadened that franchise. Um, and, and now we're asking somewhat different questions about democracy. Um, I do recommend Astra Taylor's movie, um, uh, uh, What is Democracy? And her book, Democracy, and it may not exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. Um, and out of that is when I said, Amer for America, liberty, yes. Equality, it depends. Um, again, that relate, what's that relationship between democracy, freedom, and equality? Uh, in Astra Taylor's work, one of the interesting things, as she interviewed dozens and dozens and dozens of people around the world, not just the United States, the number one thought that came to mind when people thought about democracy is liberty or freedom. She said not a single person in any place in the world, their first thought about democracy was equality. Equality, again, is not a value in the, is a value in the Declaration and in the Gettysburg Address, but not in the Constitution. And even in the Declaration, the business about, you know, all men being created equal clearly did not include women, as Abigail Adams uh, uh, reminded her husband, you know, remember the ladies uh, and don't make men continue to be like monarchs in the family. Didn't include enslaved Africans, or if you read all the way to the end of the Declaration, it didn't include the savages. 
the native indigenous persons who uh, uh, were uh, giving some fits on the American frontier um, where the Americans were trying to, the, the folks from the what would become the United States, the white people were trying to displace them from their land. So I think about it when I can, can you imagine, can you imagine uh, this little scene? That they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! I don't want that again. Okay, good. Moved on. Can you imagine if that, if, if what he said is they may take our lives, but they'll never take our equality? No. No. Where is it? So inequality is when I think about threats to uh, democratic uh, equality, uh, to the threats to democracy, a major threat is inequality today. Um, inequality is always a threat to the American promise. Um, so I'm going to go through very quickly a series of charts. Um, uh, if you ask me for the slides, I'm happy to give these to you. And uh, between Pew Research and Bloomberg uh, and uh, uh, the CDC and the Census Bureau and the like, you'll find all of these uh, charts out there. Uh, in this first one, you see the difference in, in income. Uh, uh, from 1970 to 2018, and in share of that income in each of the ranks, uh, economic ranks of society, uh, and and who's gaining the upper hand, even more of the upper hand. Um, uh, this is uh, this is not income. This is wealth. Huge, huge, important indicator of equity, uh, especially from generation to generation. You see where upper income has went, where middle income has gone, and where lower income has stayed. Um, very importantly, look at the difference in this slide between uh, white households and black households in terms of net worth. Uh, this is a super important figure when it comes to how well or, or poorly we're doing in terms of American democracy and its promise. Um, this is uh, um, a little, little blurry, but you'll get it. It's uh, income by county uh, in the U.S. And you look at where the lightest is uh, across uh, 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 southern and rural tiers um, uh, of, of, of the nation. And uh, uh, look at this one. This is life expectancy at birth. Uh, and various U.S. census tracts, with red being the lowest life expectancy and the deep blue uh, being the highest life expectancy. And, and I'm sure you'd see if we overlaid the last map with this one, how much uh, uh, congruence there would be between income and life expectancy. Um, equality, democracy, eh, these are evidences for something else. There are some other threats to liberal democracy that I'm going to go through uh, uh, here now. Um, uh, in the book, How Democracies Die, uh, the authors talk about the um, breakdown of toleration and forbearance, uh, uh, which came uh, in the, uh, from 1964 on. Uh, they said basically from the Civil War up until the Civil Rights Movement and the passage of the Voting Rights and Civil Rights Acts. Um, the Congress, uh, the House and the, and the Senate were pretty much white gentlemen's clubs. And they uh, had some rules of decorum that they uh, uh, worked with each other with, and they would do some compromises, and they would uh, practice, they would tolerate each other, uh, allowing the you know, states to do a whole lot of things that you know, weren't really authorized at a national level in terms of how persons were disadvantaged uh, by the color of their skin. And, uh, and also not using all the power they might have had to crush the opponent uh, if you had uh, uh, that much majority. Those rules changed starting in 1964 as we made our first real strong attempts uh, in, in a post-Civil War and after Reconstruction failed uh, to become a genuinely multicultural uh, a democracy where there was really some shared power 
uh, between white people and people of color. Um, social media uh, certainly has contributed to some of this breakdown. It can be marvelous. It's a great connecting tool. It also creates echo chambers and has been a tremendous source uh, uh, for spreading false information, conspiracy narratives, and connecting people with fringe thought, what would have been fringe thoughts in another era because they were so small and uh, those persons were so small in number here and here and here, but connect them all up via the internet and now they're not so small anymore. Um, the image of being a consumer rather than a citizen, uh, uh, the, what it takes to be a consumer versus what it takes to be a citizen, uh, it's a really different uh, set of expectations and practices and the like. Um, to reach their own facts, you cannot have a deliberative democracy. Uh, uh, where you're trying to make decisions as conditions change if you can't have a basic agreement on what the facts are. Uh, the old myth, as we talked about last week, the old myth of the U.S. as an exceptional nation is in some significant ways dying, uh, and we don't know what, if anything, is going to be able to take its place. And as that quote from Ann Carson that I gave in the... Uh, uh, discussion on Thursday, uh, when a nation uh, lives, when a people lives beyond its myth, it's a dangerous place to be. And we see in, in, in public life a near absent attention to public virtues. Uh, when I think of, can you imagine a politician doing JFK's ask not speech today um, uh, that really demanded something of citizenry uh, other than, you know, buy stuff, pay your taxes, go vote, but actual, you know, stronger participation in civic life and the like. Uh, we're just in a different place. Um, the last thing I want to say in terms of threat to, to American democracy is, I believe, the Christian right um, and its influence over the last 40 years and what has been degraded. By the way, the um, uh, picture on the right here, the political cartoon comes from uh, our late friend, um, uh, Doug Marlett, um, and Jesus with the rolled eyes rather than Solomon's head of Christ uh, uh, is what you're looking at there. Um, and remember, the Christian right is not all evangelicals. It is not all Republicans. It is that segment of, of the Christian community, uh, a Christian community, and a kind of politics that have come together in a series of uh, organizations, institutions, and the like, with a, with quite a common agenda. Um, we talk sometimes in sociology about a sacred canopy, right? About the um, religious warrants for action uh, in public life, about the way in which religion can form this sort of a, um, we bless this, um, which also sometimes means we reject this, but the, but the kind of blessing for various ways of being in public life. Uh, the moral order of a particular sort, um, the, the basic narratives of a particular sort, a sense of who belongs and who doesn't, and of what it means to be empowered. Sacred canopy is also referred to, we talk about, uh, that we, you know, as politics uh, itself and an agenda of a particular party. Is that really real as in at the level of godliness, uh, at a created order? Rather than you know, it's part of culture, it's 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 more of the level of the practical, uh, which means that things could be different from the way they are, um, and uh, in the human and fallible, as in well, I might be wrong. Um, the, the depending on what sacred canopy you have over your culture, you can make those kinds of claims. Um, the Christian right is particularly fond of the metaphor of war and of faith being a battle, which is enacted uh, in public life. Um, and this is also a, a version of religion that has been highly aligned uh, with free market capitalism, uh, opposed very much to the new deals of the FDR administration, um, and have been working with a particular segment of the political community uh, and, uh, and the um, business communities to uh, undermine and eliminate, in fact, uh, the reforms and the progressive uh, programs of the, um, of the New Deal. 
Um, and if you want to know who, where you can find all that, there's a book by Kevin Cruz called One Nation Under God, How uh, Corporate America Invented Christian America, that I would highly rec uh, recommend. Cruz, K-R-U-S-E, One Nation Under God. It's a really, really interesting, uh, revealing read. All right. I'm going to go through this uh, fairly quickly, uh, but look at this list of things of what the Christian right is warring against. Um, the constru a particular construction of history, which is anything other than Christian nation, uh, war against drugs, uh, the mass incarceration being one of the, the uh, results, uh, a war against public schools, which are often referred to as government schools, a war against women ri women's rights, uh, in, in the name of patriarchy, a, a war against any non-binary understanding of everything related to gender and sexuality, um, uh, against gun control, uh, uh, Second Amendment rights are, are close second to First Amendment rights for, for many folks who believe this way, um, a war against the federal government. It's all about states' rights, especially in matters of equality. The states get to determine that, not the federal government. Um, war against anti-racism work. They look at racism as an individual sin and uh, have a deep suspicion of any kind of talk about anti-racism as that comes from Marxism. Um, uh, a war against equality for what God grants different persons, different abilities, and each should be able to use their talents, including the talent for making money, unhindered by external forces. A war against social safety nets. Uh, government takes over parenting, families, churches, if you allow for a social safety net. Um, a war against multi-religious America and secular America, because there's only one kind of a real America, and that would be Christian America. A war against abortion, uh, taking innocent life yet in utero. Um, uh, a war against same-sex marriage, uh, which we already see. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, that fight is... Uh, is on the horizon of, of um, uh, the next uh, term of the Supreme Court. Um, uh, war against climate change and alternatives to fossil fuels, anything that hinders the extractive colonial economy mindset that's dominated the landscape for 400 years, um, the Christian right has been mostly in opposition to. Um, a war against experimental science, evolution, and its timeline for there being a 14 billion year old universe rather than a 4004 BC, uh, BCE created universe uh, uh, because uh, science is seen as a, as a still as a um, in competition with the authority of religion. Uh, war against immigration and the change complexion in the United States since the immigration laws changed in 1965. A war against social justice because there is no such thing as social justice. There's righteousness, there's charity, but social justice is not something that the government is supposed to be involved in, even if it would really exist. A war against systems per se. Um, there's, there are individuals, there are states and the like, but for them, there are no systems except perhaps communism and socialism. They may have systems, but in free enterprise economy, uh, in the economy of salvation, it's all about the individual. There are no systems. Um, there have been also warring against the Affordable Care Act uh, as an embodiment of socialism, communism, taking control away, and against protesters and movements that are left of center. That's a long, warring list, and, and there's evidence, strong evidence, for each of these uh, and the involvement of the Christian right in these causes, which then begs the question, if the Christian right were completely successful, what would democracy look like in this country? So, coming to the end here, uh, thinking about 2020 with apologies to Mr. Lincoln, this is where I think we're at. Twelve score and four years ago, our founders brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all human beings are created equal. For the second time in our history, we are testing whether the, that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. So returning to our big idea, what's the optimal relationship between democracy, liberty, and equality in the U.S.? 
first, democracy and liberty, I get to choose. I get to choose. Choice. Choice. Freedom of choice. Which sometimes translates as to the liberty uh, sort is you're not the boss of me. Uh, you know, there's a nation without bosses. Not really, but that, how it sometimes gets spun. If you introduce equality into that mix, that complicates liberty. For now, you've got a relationship, unless eudaimonism is an accurate philosophy, that is. Uh, eudaimonism says that each can pursue their own happiness, and some unseen, uh, by some unseen hand, uh, all of these pursuits of happiness will somehow be harmonized. Uh, I'm not so much a believer. Uh, created equal. Uh, it may mean that created equal, that we're all created equal, but what we do with our born equality is up to each person. It may mean created equal, and for the sake of social stability as well as justice, a democratic society should limit inequality. Um, it may mean uh, that uh, we're not created equal in any meaningful way. Uh, and, it's, and we really are uh, a society, a democracy, uh, of the type that's survival of the fittest. So, what do you think? What do you think? Maybe that leads us into um, some things for uh, week three. Uh, we're going to del delve deeper next week into um, these uh, prominent cultural narratives of the spirit of democracy, of the Christian right, and of capitalism. So that's what we're headed for. And let's prime that question pump a little bit. Um, is your religious spiritual tradition, um, in your religious spiritual tradition, sorry, what's the basis of value of human equality? And what is the proper relationship between freedom and equality in a democratic society um, from within your, your um, faith framework? All right, don't forget to um, uh, take a look at uh, uh, Jack Jenkins' uh, 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 interview also. And look forward to seeing everybody who can uh, be there at the discussion on Thursday.